Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 26 or volume or issue. We like don't have coherent language for this of precog time. Um, with Tiempo de Safra, we're really, really lucky to be with all of you here for the first time in 2021 and also to get to share this time and get to know more about um, Edgar and Stephanie, um, who as Tiempo de Safra are a, a DR based um, garment and art fashion collaborative, uh, working with found materials, pre and post consumer materials. Um, to make really beautiful objects and sort of think about our relationship to waste and also the body in some way. We're also really lucky to um, include them in issue six of Precog Magazine. As many of y'all know, the uh, Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair is happening as we speak um, somewhere in the internet. Um, and we've also soft launched um, issue six of the magazine um, which is available for pre-order on the site. Um, so that's basically just a general hello and introduction. We're really lucky that Alex Santana, who interviewed Tiempo de Stafra, is also here. Um, and I think that's it. So we'll start the way that we start all of these and just ask y'all how your quarantine, this like extended three week year long quarantine has been for all of you. Uh, very busy, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of time reflect and navigate, you know, what our goal is in all of this, like for us as a business, for us as artists, individuals, um, things that we needed to unravel and things, you know, getting out of our own way sometimes and doing the damn thing. Um, I would say that it's been, it's been super wonderful for us. We feel, you know, it's real, you know, a lot of things have been happening um, that have, humbled us, allowed us to see things differently and, you know, question how we, how we move about and how we consume, you know, on another level. And, um, yeah, it's been, it's been, yeah. Pretty and we have a curfew. So our we have, curfew yeah, is, we have a crazy curfew. So. Our curfew is uh, interesting because we are, um, so we're in the Dominican Republic as everybody knows. Um, and, uh, we've been on curfew since like March, right? Like, last year March. Yeah, yeah last year so March. Be a year. The curfew is uh it's been very it strict and it fluctuates like uh for example at one point we had to be home at twelve um in the afternoon. In the afternoon and uh I know. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. And you had like, that was maybe, like during the holidays. During the holidays, right? You had like two hours maybe to get home and then on the weekdays, I believe that the curfew was at was it two? No, was it five? You five had to be home at five and you had a few hours to get home. So that that happened for months, and then they were they they like kind of like loosened up a little bit. So now it's uh, now the curfew is from uh, it's seven. seven on the you weekdays. Have three hours you have three go. hours to get home, so you got to be home by ten. Um, and then on the weekends, and it's, it's mandatory. five. Yeah, and then you, you have three hours. Arrested. Yeah, it's mandatory. You get arrested, all that. So it's been really interesting. And I think we're like homebodies. We have our like our studio is like our home. So I think a lot of the it was it, it wasn't like a huge change for us. It was more like you can't go outside, right? You can't go for that walk, and then just like the nature of everything, you know, changed uh, globally. I think um, at first it was very like draining, right, to look at all this information. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like following numbers and shit, like, oh my god, what's happening? You know, I'm like looking at people as numbers, and I think it's just like uh, it's yeah, a lot. It's it was a lot. Super, yeah. it was very overwhelming. Yeah. So to be able to navigate through those things and just find like more uh, just be able to rechannel and yeah. recalibrate and just be able to put our focus into other things um because it, lot, yeah. yeah it helped a lot definitely and sometimes it honestly felt like yeah. oppressive in some ways because it's like wow you know um being indoors you know i mean everybody felt that just like being indoors and just kind of being to yourself and but it in the end it's like it felt positive yeah. I was in, a way, yeah. in a weird way so I'm wondering if you could just start us off talking about um how you a little bit about uh how you work what you make and I think some origin story level kind of development like how did y'all meet how did you become interested in uh, making what you make 
Um, so um, it started in New York, New York City, um, with me and my father. We um, we kind of just like had started having these conversations about because my so my family they also like my my dad's a tailor, my grandfather uh, comes from that as well. My like everybody in my in my home, like growing up, I always knew my my family. Um, worked in like with clothing they made clothing so I always looked at it like oh making clothes not necessarily as like something that was like fashion or more technical so then um we end up like just kind of like sitting down together and start to like go to like second like secondhand shops and like uh family no, dollars and like whatever those those like uh dollar stores in Harlem or like anywhere we would find uh, material and started to like really just started to like deconstruct the stuff and mix stuff with it and then from there we started to like have these conversations about family for me it was like a moment for me to sit down with my pops and kind of like learn about my like my origins like where I came from and we started to talk and my dad would tell me stories about just how my family had come uh, to Dominican Republic from like small highlands to like work in the sugarcane fields and all this stuff and like they came for jobs and they started doing other jobs and then they decided to like uh, like how do you say assimilate more to the culture and then it's like from there that's where like the name comes from like the for the Safra means like time of abundance it's a time of the year when like sugarcane is like harvested so the, so everything starts from there like from a conversation like a family conversation with my father and then um we start like making stuff kind of like randomly like just hey we want to make this or whatever and then and I'm also learning with him right and then because the I didn't yeah I wasn't necessarily like I didn't have the technical yet. I was just like working with my dad. I knew how to work the machines, but um, from there, like we started to shoot stuff and make stuff. So then we made like a small collection. I met Stephanie during that time and we started to work on like capturing that, you know, like- I helped with the documentation, he, yeah. of, like a presentation we did, like we, we brought his pieces to 181st Street um, and I documented it, like their interactions with people and just the process of that. And that was kind of like my first goal with my point of view because he had seen my work and he was like, yo, you know, I want to do this. Like, can you help me bring it to life? So, you know, I showed up, Grave showed up, yeah. and his friend showed up and then, you know, we did it. And then from there, we just kept on working. We still, yeah, we kept on working. But the thing on 181st Street was because for me, like, um, I always felt like 181st Street in like St. Nick. Is that St. Nicholas, right? Yeah, in St. Nicholas, it was like, all the vendors were outside and it was like always super informal, all this noise, all this chaos. And for me, it reminded me so much of like the Dominican Republic in some aspects. Like it reminded me of me like going to, to like markets, going to like the chaos, people moving around and everything. And I, I wanted to like, like early on, like I wanted to like just oppose that. Like I wanted to be right there in between all this stuff going on and say like, oh, I'm going to set up shop right here. But it was like metaphoric, like I'm setting up shop wherever I can on the street, doesn't matter, right? Because I feel like is this something that like, as immigrants, like you do, right? You come and you just set up like wherever, just to keep going, right? You set up, you go to a new town, um, you get that job and you just go, right? And then you start building a life like that. And I think like that reminded me so much of like, just family things. And I think from there, things started to progress like that. But like this idea of like informality, and, like the informal markets and like the vendors and like what they sell, how you sell it. It's like the idea that we were talking about, like how do you, how do you think about a product and how do you sell a product and where? And I think that that's like one of the reasons why we did that, that like installation in uh, on 181st in front of uh, Banco Popular. <laughs> so it was like, um, it was that type of, it was that type of energy. And I think it was like, from there we started to think like, oh, you know, we can do so much more as uh, like working together as a collective and like, what can we do? So that's how we, uh, that's how we met. Right, because you can't do anything without a team. Right. That's first and foremost. Yeah. When, and I when, wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your design influences. Like, is there something in the silhouettes you're working with that it's, you know, you're thinking about? Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't necessarily, I, don't, I wouldn't say this like a reference that I have on the board that I'm looking at all the time, but I think the environment is the reference, right? Like, the, uh, being, being here, right? Like, um, sort of like also speaking for like, what I see, right, as like as a Dominican and Dominican Republic creating, and also like having this like having this platform where I can like maybe we can shine light on things that aren't necessarily being being talked about, and how we can like shine light on just like the randomness and sometimes like the magical 
things that happen that are just like, wait, is this is this really happening? And, and why is this happening like this? You know, and like the the environment, the the colors, um, the architecture, um, this idea of like working on top of something that already exists because one has to, right? And or one has one has to create um, because there's no other choice. So that, like the idea of like. Uh, creativity through like necessity like what that those nuances that that creates like i give you an example like there might be somebody selling um there might be somebody that has a product it can be fruits it can be platinum it can be whatever right and then he's gonna he's gonna do whatever he can to sell these things right and he's gonna he's gonna take like uh i always say this like he's gonna take a stroller and he's gonna take a stroller and he's gonna work with the structure of the stroller and chop it up and put wood on it and do whatever he can to be able to hold his fruits on it. And then he's going to push this down the neighborhood and he's going to yell that he's selling this stuff. And I think that that it has a lot of the things that influence like what we do is kind of like um, what is done informally as commerce, but it's still like part of like the formal, right? And so I know it's a really important part of what you're making now, the fact that you're in Dominican Republic. Um, and like right now we're showing some pictures which are of some inspirations or touchstones from the environment. So I was yeah. wondering if you could talk, and you've talked a little bit about the informal markets, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the environment and how it contributes to what you make. Um, and then also um, literally beginning to talk about how you make your garments um, and the relationship between um, abundance, the this idea that you're talking about with ab abundance in Tiempo de Safra and your relationship to sustainability and um, materiality in garments. I would say, I would say with the environment, um, outside of the Fuga, I would say, you know, the climate is something, again, that's very, you know, important for us. The, the climate, not only just the weather, but the cultural climate of things, the movement of the environment, like why certain things will, like people will wear certain shirts with vents that, you know, keep them cool. And like the functionality in a lot of times and the colors and just how, like the the, the Caribbean uniform, I think is something that we always pay attention to um, that constantly inspire what we do, you know, like we we love winter clothes because you know we're in new york and we love the fact of layering but there's this essence of just like you know it's very colorful the 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 excess materials that we make fine yeah, so that's also that thing. can dictate you know mm -hmm. how the garment turns out mm -hmm. and then it ends up being like a representation of the caribbean exactly because it's, super the colorful. it's yeah exactly it's like it's also interesting if you can go back to the photo of the car because i can i can kind of Give you a story, give you like a, the, the other one with the, the one with the shirt. The shirt on the seat. Go up, up more. Oh, the shirt's in the car. Okay, sorry. So like, for example, like this this image here. Um, if you look at the image of the driver's seat, like that's the that's the shirt that is on that car like every day. So this is another thing that we were talking about. Like, so he needs to he needs to cover his seat because his seat is old. This car is like an old Toyota Corolla. Uh, 1995 right very old um so he's doing whatever he can to like just keep working right and do what he got to do so i think like the shirt the driver's shirt was is originally how the shirts are right we see a lot of these shirts sometimes you see four or five shirts on it right and it's like kind of like and for us it was really interesting because we were like yo how can we we talked about how can we how can we, we we do these shirts where we take we go to this we go to the, the market we buy these t-shirts which is like some of them are like single use t-shirts which is like i know mean, you guys heard that it's like right and, charity and like, like runs a, a like reunion, runs right all that. i love you henry and like whatever like you don't know who henry is after so like all these things right so like we'll take these t-shirts and on the back of them we'll, we'll do like our own like our graphic and then these are t-shirts that we were doing like limited and every t-shirt on the back is different but then you have this graphic which is like the world and it says no other species uh, things the world revolves around them so whatever so then we were talking about how, how can we present this or how can we show this in a way that has never been shown before uh or like how can we do something that represents the place that we're at and like also highlight something that i think is very innovative it's a different type of innovation but i think it's innovation nonetheless so that's how this picture came about. Cause we were like, yo, how, how about we just to show the car and show like how interesting it is that these people are already doing this. This is something this guy already does. Like 
why don't we just show the shirt around the seat, like the way we see it all the time. So instead of putting it on a hanger or putting it on a, on, a, on a model, like the model is the seat as a way to talk about like things that we're seeing every day, but also it's like to big up this, to big up this innovation, this like innovation of like doing what you can, right? Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of like the influences are that. And then the materials, like Stephanie was saying, they dictate a lot of like what happens because if we're sourcing from a, from a shirt maker and he's making shirts for, for gentlemen that live in the Dominican Republic and they're making chacabanas and the chacabanas usually are like, they have, they're really bright on the brighter side. Um, some or of them white, are all white or baby, blue. or baby blue. And these colors are very predominant. Like the clothes come out like that, right? Because this is where we're sourcing the material. Like we're not pushing and saying um we want it to be this but we're saying like okay we got this what can we make out of it you know it's like working with a challenge in a way yeah. like it navigates how the garment ends up turning out because that shirt in specific that white shirt in specific that was there it's like the pieces were that long triangle yeah. but it ended up turning into a exactly, design yeah. part of the shirt yeah. Yeah. yeah so then the yeah so they were cut like that when they were cut the shirts what was left over was a pile of like triangles and it was like, I guess they, so like, they cut it with the laser. Yeah, machine. they cut it with the machine. And then when the, whatever's left over, it was like a triangle. So I just took those triangles and laid it on top of the pattern and made that um, as a way to like, for it to challenge me to say, oh, what can I make with this? So, and then to put it in the shirt as like, oh, this is what we made with it instead of throwing it away. Um, yeah, and then you need to remind me of the other uh, questions. Also, that was, those were all the questions. I mean, it was yeah. just, it's interesting. I mean, because, I mean, we know, and we know from your interview that like a lot of your sourcing is from the markets and also um, like pre and post consumer um, like production factories in the Dominican okay. Republic. And so I was wondering also maybe as a follow-up to that question, like what the status is of these used materials on the island and like why that was something that drew you into it was, it was I'll tell you it was, it was something where like I think you know you see so much of it because I, I feel like um we talk about like globalization like what that does like what happens when something grows very fast and like maybe there's infrastructural things that don't necessarily catch up as fast as fast as uh, they should right um and also um, just thinking about like how much if some like places that are growing and like the economy is is somewhat like um, like always every year you see it growing right it's like advancing. yeah it's advancing like, like you see like Dominican Republic and you kind of can see like there's a lot of poverty there's a lot of things that happen like other countries that are like our like our country but you also know that it's growing like in a lot of ways right so then like the speed of that I think also creates a lot of waste right. When you have more production, you create more waste. And I think the handling of that isn't necessarily like caught up to like mm -hmm. how fast things are moving. So, so you see a lot of, you see a lot of waste. You see a lot of like excess in a lot of different ways. You don't just see necessarily fabric, but you can see excess in anything. You can go to a district where they they fix TVs and you'll see like a lot of that stuff that's left over, a lot, of electronic, a lot of electronic waste that's, you know, left over from that. And I don't necessarily think it's like, um, it's not all of like a, yes, it's like how the person handles it, but I think also it has to do with a lot of different things. Like how do, you know, how a law is put in place and then at the same time, how do we create vehicles for the citizens to be able to do this in a more effective way, like dispose of stuff. And then like behind that, it's also like, how do you uh, communicate that there's another way to look at waste and that we shouldn't be like just dishing it off because it doesn't, when, you, when it goes to the landfills, it turns into something else that harms us, right? Mm -hmm. Very simple, like we don't have to be scientists to like understand that. So I think uh, the, the state of that is something where like, yeah, you see it all the time. I think we stumbled upon it uh, so much is working in the field that we work and it's like you will walk down the street and maybe even as a regular citizen, yeah, a you see that on a regular yeah, basis you might see and it's, it's normalized in a way where yeah. people are just like, oh, well, you know, it's been like that, yeah. you know, so it, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's something where you see it. So it's like, we saw, for example, that the hat we started to make out of an accident, right? I would say it's an accident because we were walking and uh, we were outside a gentleman's shop and he's a tailor uh, here in the Sona Colonial and then he, he basically on on Saturdays he throws away all, all the stuff that's that's left over. And I don't know if it was a mistake they made or something, but we found like two huge bags of like these these are forces. And our forces are like uh 
traditionally used in Chacabanas, right? You see them down the down the middle of the shirt. Uh, some people call them, some, some places call them guayaberas. They all have different names. They make them in Mexico, Colombia. I seen them in Thailand, these hats, right? So we found these strips and then we started to like experiment with them and put them together. But initially this, these was, these were all in the trash, the first batch we found of these. Two bags, perfectly new, clean. They weren't, they were in good condition. They were just short. And the thing is that when you put them on Chacabana, they're long and you can't stitch them together because they don't look, they, they're not aesthetically pleasing. So you just throw them out. And that's how we started to like, that's what that was, that's how we started to really work with this stuff and think about like, wait, we can be doing this in more places. We could be like visiting the guy who makes denim and collecting from him, visiting the guy who makes anything else and collecting from them. So um, that's how it kind of came about. It was an accident, but also something that we were very like aware of. And we were like, wait, you know, we could just source also from factories, not just the market. So whenever we get an opportunity and we see something, we definitely like, I'm like, yeah, let's go. I'll, I'll, I can use that access or whatever. And now do you have people that just call you like, I have a bag of stuff, like come pick it up. <laughs> yeah, we have sometimes, sometimes that happens, but you know, I always say this, which is really interesting. It's like, you know, if we were to sit here and take everything that people throw out, like this house would be filled to the top, right? Like <laughs> first week, first week, first week, it would be filled to the top. So it's very interesting because we know that like what we're doing is highlighting something. We're having a conversation that a lot of other people are having as well. Like this is not like, this shouldn't feel like, oh, this is one, no, this should be like, oh, everyone should be having their own conversation in a way, or at least being aware of it, or at least teaching their kids or their cousin or whoever and being aware of like, yo, this is really something that's happening. Like we are dealing with a lot of excess. Like it's not just like I throw this on and then I don't care about it. Like what happens to this stuff? It's, and it's not only the clothing and, and fabrics, it's like electronics, it's everything, right? So just being aware of this stuff, I think is important. So again, we're like part of a conversation that is already happening, it's huge, right? Um, and we all- uh, I, I was gonna all. ask you actually about that because I, I was, we had a question about, you know, in the New York Times, they had this article about upcycling and this guy that was cutting up quilts and turning them into jackets. And then this other person's like, no, that was invented by Bode like in two years ago. And then you have a lot of people trying to be like, I did it first. And then I'm like, you know, this has been going on forever. Like, you know, like, yeah, like, that goes back. Yeah, that's not like, I don't know. It's like, I always we're going yeah, back to and, like, and putting things together. We were looking at, um, we were just looking at a video and it was like, uh, somebody was doing an interview, somebody was doing like a documentary in Haiti about Gaga, um, which is like, you know, it's like religious ceremonies. There's a lot that goes into it. You guys can like, it's, it's a lot, but you guys can Google like yourselves. Gaga, Haiti or whatever. And you guys will see what I'm talking about, but it's part of the religion there. I, I don't, I'm not sure if like, it's like, uh, the, like by the country is like the main religion, but I've heard that, but I don't know if that's true. Don't quote me on that anyway. Nonetheless, we were looking at these dresses that the women were wearing and there was like, there was one, this one specific dress and it was like, it was patchwork from top to bottom, you know? And it could have been made by anyone who's like on this wave of like making things for other things, right? That already exists. So I think, again, when I think about like the scenario of her life and why she made it like this, it could be like, this is what she had available. It could also be the colors that are associated with what she's doing. It could also be something that she had to make it by hand because that's the way that she has to express it. There's so many things that go into it, but to think that like, like old ladies here haven't been sewing like scraps together and doing things like that, like quilts. Like, I don't know if you guys know about, know about uh, G's Bend and all that, and, right? And it's like, uh, what's his name? Thornton, Thornton, Thornton. Dial, Thornton Dial and those guys, like what? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, at, yeah, Alabama, so it's like, it's my fuck you think about they were doing that in the they were doing that a long time ago, hundred years ago. These women were making quilts and I heard that they were like hiding holes and like they will hide the quilts and like go back and then go back and work on them in the forest. It's like there's so much history behind like reusing stuff and like working with what you have available. I think it's more about working with what you have available than necessarily like a trend, right? Yeah, well, no, that's what I was wondering, because I was like, this is totally something that could be like, you know, Urban Outfitters is like, now we upcycle, but they're doing it with like factories, you know, and then people don't really, like, I think the consumer has to be really educated about like, okay, 
like, and what's good about your brand is that, you know, you can see you share a lot of the process and you're like, this is the people we work with, you know, it's like a very different um, experience. And I'm sure your consumer, like whoever is buying your clothes is like a different kind of like consumer that's like, you know, thinking about this is like a special thing, you know? Yeah. Well, ho hopefully, hopefully that's what's happening. Is not, uh, I, was also, trying, like, yeah. just, I think that's cool, like, you know, like that's- Yeah, uh, no, but I was also wondering, did the pandemic affect your business at all or did it get like less sales, business, more? It affected by our business by making us uh, definitely more busy. I was yeah. saying, I think that um, the pandemic was very interesting because I believe that people saw the power as a consumer and where they put their money you know and like they rather support smaller businesses and also you know there's they want to support they may not want to go to a big company anymore they're understanding like they're seeing what's going on around the world and, and what's happening and the small differences they, they can make in the way that they consume so I definitely feel like with the pandemic we got a lot of support from our friends first and foremost and uh, just you know information moving around yeah. so like we were more consistent yeah. um and we were just you know yeah. full speed ahead so yeah maybe that's what it did also when that question about how the pandemic affected you guys it's like uh, maybe it also made us like be more we you know, were able to actually sit down and be like okay we you know we have nowhere to go this is to just have to make stuff because we're here like let's just we let's were about do to it. go to new york before. right we were going to go to new york and then we didn't, we didn't end up going because of the pandemic or whatever, um, the virus came. So I think we were forced to really like uh, rethink how we were uh, doing things. And then we just started to like experiment more. And yeah, we've gotten a lot busier. Like uh, I would say, yeah, definitely a lot busier. And um, I think also uh, it's very isolated, right? And I think we can all kind of feel the same about that. Like kind of thinking about like just being around friends and having those conversations and maybe having people come by um it's changed that's changed a lot but um as far as the work is really just kind of like uh getting a little bit more uh it, it demands a little more you know more of us so they gave us more time to experiment too amazing i have um i have okay i have a question especially talking about experimentation around um sometimes you make installations with your with your work, right? So sometimes you're making the garments, and then you at the beginning we're talking about this experience um, selling or setting up on 181st Street, um, which is also super performative, right? The market is not just like about objects isolated from other objects. Like there's this whole like theater of exchange and being present and the whole situation. Um, but I was wondering, and I know this is something um, you talked about a little bit in your interview, but if you think about um, like using art spaces or how you would use that and how you might, um, like whether that would even be useful for y'all um, moving forward, if that's something you're thinking about. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think well, we, uh, it's something we think about a lot. I think before we were, uh, before we were, we think about it a lot, a lot. Uh, before we were necessary, we were like, just had that demand that we were like, oh, we have to be uh, thinking about these pieces and kind of like, more like garment, we were like just collecting stuff that we saw, yeah, in our environment. Like we have, aside from that, we have like a collection of things that we we find that also like, um, how do I say this? Like inform a lot of the stuff that we're looking at. Um, so we did, we've done like a few uh, like shows. Uh, we've been part of a few shows, group shows and things like that. Um, the thing with that is that it happens very, um, it happens very like someone would just contact us and be like, hey, we know you guys, like, for example, that question you guys asked us about that, like, you know about that, but not everyone knows that we also, you know, kind of like dive into that. And like, we have another side of the, we separate the studio and on the other side of the studio, we have all these objects, so many things. And like the flag here is kind of like, um, when we got here, it's one of the first things we made. The first thing ever made like sewing was this and this was sewn by hand on a uh on a sack that carries clothing like from the market so basically um the clothes it's basically like this but if you put it like this the clothes go inside and it gets wrapped around with the, 
with the thing that's hanging, which is like pantyhose, and they tie them. And uh, a lady gave it to gave it to us, and then we started to like make this flag as a way to like. I, it was like a way to pay homage and say like, you know, we want to talk about this, but it's not to say that this place isn't beautiful. It's not to say that I, like, I don't love my country. I love my people. I think that it, it's, it's a place full of potential. It's a place that's magical. Like I, I can I can go on forever about how, you know, Incredible. how connected I feel to the place and like how I don't feel, I feel great being here and like feel myself. And I feel like we can really do things that are impactful and like help people like see things differently. So that was like a way to like say that, a way to pay homage. And then we made it from all the stuff that we found as a way to be like, oh, we can also use this stuff to make other things. It doesn't just have to be on our sidewalks or whatever, you know? Totally. Um, and I had just, wait, one one more sort of, this is like a real tangent here, um, kind of hard tangent. Alex made a comment, which reminded me um, where you were talking about how funny the concept of yellow colonial is, like the idea of colonial ice is just oh, yeah. itself, kind of an amusing joke. Um, but another really fascinating part of, of this, of your interview in the magazine is when you make reference to the fact that the Zona Colonial is like the oldest, it's like the oldest colonial outpost basically in um, Latin America or among one of the oldest. And I was wondering, like, I was just wondering if that's, if you, how y'all think about that, like it must be such an ever present, especially being in the old city and like yeah. um, whether, like how you think about the, your relationship to that part of history? I don't know. It's a big question. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's interesting because I think it's like when you when you put it into perspective and you talk about it like that, it's true. Like we are in a very old city, right? Uh, the first among a lot of things, right? Uh, like a, a guide for a lot of other cities that were made, right? Even like uh, we can talk about um, everything down to slavery. A lot of the things that happened in the Caribbean happened first right so and we live in this place right surrounded by this wall that you see at certain points where it's chopped off but you see where the wall was and you can kind of feel like wow this is what they were feeling or like this is kind of crazy that this is this is still here and um I think I don't know how like to be honest it wasn't something that was planned like my sister also lives here and um, so I have family here, right? In the Zona Colonial, so it wasn't really planned, but after like time has passed, I'm kind of like, wow, it's so interesting that we're in this place, right? That has so much history and kind of like navigating, navigate, navigating history. Cause I feel like a lot of the things that we are talking about is like things that have been discarded, like that have this time in them, like things that were part of something else, you know? And like now they're, they're they, now we're looking at them and saying, how can we, how can we create something new with them and give them like more time, like elongate, like that, that life cycle that they have. So I think like, Sona Colonial kind of feels like that, where like, you have this thing where you want to keep something alive, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things here that make me feel like that, where like, you'll see a building on the front of it and it looks very colonial it's and it's preserved. like, it's preserved, beautiful, but on the back of it, it's empty or like, the it's decay, is right? And it's like, but you want to keep the facade in order to like um, keep this history alive, right? You want to keep this history alive because it means so much to the history of the world as well, you know? So I don't know. It's it's, it's a very, like you said, I think it's a very like, it's a very, uh, it's a very complex question. I think also like I had read this book about, uh, it was called Lemba and Lemba, was like a, a slave that, like a revolutionary that had escaped um, during plantation days and he had ran off and he was like a rebel. He, had, he would come back with, you know, other slaves he had like gotten with him and he would go in and like burn plantation. He did this for a very long time in the Dominican Republic, La Española at the time, whatever. So I had read this book about um, this area and like how they had like, at, at that time they had chopped his head and put it like, at the door of the corner, whatever. And like, I had, I had, when I came and I was like looking for these places, like I was like, oh, I had come here as a kid, as a small, as a small kid, but I want to come now as a grown up, and I want to go to these places and I want to like, like see all this stuff that I'm reading about. And um, I think it's still that feeling where I'm just like, yo, it's, it's so crazy that in such and such year, like 
this was the city, right? This was the city that people were looking at around the world, like, oh, there's a new settlement somewhere, you know? So it's like, it's interesting to say the least. I think you guys should visit, probably. Yeah. <laughs> and it's beautiful as well, right? It's beautiful. A lot of people come here, um, it's like a tourist spot at the same time. Um, so it's a lot, it's a lot of history, but it's also like a place that's fun, you know? Um, and then Alex had another question, which she's asking, did you see the Eckhaus Lata exhibition at the Whitney? And if so, what do you um, think? Look, oh, the questions, I'm not looking at the questions. Oh no, we'll, we'll answer, we'll do uh, um, all the, you don't have to, I'll ask them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, later, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can start oh, we now. Could. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was looking at it. I kind of like went off like, wait, what is that? Anyway. Yeah. Um, I'll close it. Okay. So yeah. So what was the question? I'm sorry. If we saw that oh, if you, uh, exhibition and what did we think about it? No, Tom. I, I don't think we it were caused a lot of like time. I saw like a, no. a snippet. I saw a snippet of it. I no. thought it was interesting. It was a while. The one. We were here. Ago, we were right? here. We were here already. We were so here, we didn't yeah. get to see it in person. We were here. Yeah. I saw it online. I, I, I like the concept. I thought it was interesting. Um, I miss that. I, I miss going to the Whitney. I miss way. going. Yeah. I miss going to museums and galleries for yeah. sure because a lot of the things here are not um, open. Yeah, they're closed and like, yeah. And also I think, you know, being in New York, a lot of things get to New York, right? Like you see a lot of exhibits that just pass by New York. Yeah. And a lot of art is, is consumed in New York. Um, I think it's such a, like a, it can be such a learning ground too, as far as like culture and art, New York City is such a place for that, right? Like you could just on your own, start visiting museums and go into little galleries and get really like in tune with what's happening, right? And I think that that's something that's very unique. Uh, to New York and I think to other cities that like have like a culture like that. I think um, there's, there's museums here, um, but there isn't that like, you know, that there isn't that, that, that energy you get in New York obviously because it's bigger. So um, they, have a, they have a museum here that I think we visited when we first got here. Um, I think it's, it's, the museum is closed, the Contemporary Art Museum. And I think we saw an exhibition that had a lot of like found work in it, right? It was like uh, a lot of really, really interesting artists. And um, from there, we started to see like a lot of the things that we saw in that exhibit on the street, just randomly. Like we would see a lot of like the things that were informing some of the work just on the street by people who weren't thinking they were, they were considering mm -hmm. artists. And I think that was like the stuff that was like, wow, like sometimes it's every day walking around, you can see things that are really, really inspiring that are like, super random and you kind of are thinking like, wow, this person didn't think of it like aesthetically or like they weren't really thinking of, of making a piece or something, but you're like, yo, I would tell that guy that I would buy that umbrella for him and buy, I'll buy a new umbrella for him and just take that old one because it looks amazing. You know, it's like that type of thing, you know? Um, Luciana Cruz has a question sort of which dovetails really well with this, uh, what you've been talking about which is about um, the role of daily life in Ciudad Nueva and whether and how it influences the way that you document the environment. Definitely. Yeah, yeah totally, for sure. 100%. Because sometimes, you know, there's absurdities, like things that you, this magical realism that we always talk about. It's like something, sometimes you'll be walking down the street and you'll see something and the way like, Edgar was talking about a stroller, you know, carrying like certain snacks and somebody's just maneuvering through that or somebody that has a sack that's on their head and they're carrying this, you know, cart full of things. And, it, and, and like, just, why are you carrying this cart full of like objects, objects and that random you, things? Right. And, I mean, you can see it's that in the so subway many things, sometimes right? yeah. too, but it's very interesting how it, when you walk outside, even for a just a regular stroll, you'll see things that just kind of blow you away. And you're like, did I really see that? Wow. Like, and, and those things then transpire and become ideas or things that we think about. And then we amplify and bring it into Tiempo de Zafra yeah. and, and how we document our work and um, like seeing certain colors and architecture, like you had said earlier, like, and then going back and allowing that to become part of the garment. And then in turn, like, there's also this, um, 
the sounds and the movement within the streets, that also is part of my editing process. I feel like it sometimes can be very abrupt. It can be fast. You can see certain details and like little things in a fast you know, pace. Mm -hmm. It very much is all intertwined with just like the hustle and bustle. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it can be, I think, um, the documentation aspect, like we, you know, like a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the footage that, that Stephanie's shooting um, VHS camera, um, it has a feel to it, right? But then the environment has a feel to it that kind of coincides with the feel of like how things are being shot. And there's like, there's aspects of like living in Santo Domingo that are very informal, like also battling with something being super formal. And then I think like that clash of like the informal and the formal is what creates the stuff that's like super random, you know? So, so yeah, like to answer that question, I think it's like, everyday life here is very interesting because um, it can be different because of the things that you see, like visually, um, it's very stimulating visual. Um, and also say. I'll say too, that there's a lot of um, richness, the things you see outside that sometimes you'll see one day and then it's not there anymore. Right. Even like with traditions, uh, with buildings, with the way of somebody car painted looks, something over, the way something was painted over, like this crazy graphic that you saw, or like these wild layers, and then the next day it's, it's like gone. totally gone. Right. Like that happens to us very often if we yeah. don't, you know, like we always tell ourselves, oh, we got to go back and shoot this if like we didn't have a, a phone right. or a camera or anything. Yeah. Um, oh, but, we got to pick this up, or like we saw this thing and it's like, oh, we didn't grab that. And we come back five minutes later and somebody else grabs it because somebody else is looking for it too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was like, like, oh, I can use it for this, yeah, right? So. so yeah, that's that's definitely very part of, of the documentation process. Yeah. I guess and the stuff that kind of like makes us happy is weird because it's like, we just get happy when we find something that's like, I don't know, we found a bumper one time with a license plate on it. And I was so geeked. I was like, I can't believe I found this. Like I was, just, I saw it. I was like, oh my God, what I'm going to make with this thing. And the story is yeah, that it washed right. up ashore. From yeah, beginning. right. So we found so. a bumper with a license plate on washing up ashore. So we were like looking and we were like, is that a bumper? And I was like, does that have a license plate? I was like, why is it? And I just, I grabbed it and I just, you know, I have it stashed back there. And I'm like, I know this is going to come in handy one day. But things like that that are like, that's random, right? I don't know. You guys think that's random? Because I'm like. I mean, it's so. often that people find right. bumpers washing up ashore. So things like that, I don't know. Um, and a lot of like I said. I want to ask about this last image, the flyer, the last one. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. This is like, um, it's like that song, like to every thing, there is a season, you know, the turn. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time, right? Right, every, everything, right, it's just, yeah, it's a, uh, it's Salmos. Salmos, yeah. something, right? It's like, you can see it in there and it says everything. Yeah. But these are, these are pamphlets that are passed out here on the street. Um, Evangelicals uh, pass these out on the streets. Um, sometimes they're preaching and they pass them out. They all have very, uh, very interesting graphics on them that we, we like a lot. Um, I think it's like a nuance of the streets here. You'll see them on the street sometimes. And um, we've been playing with them kind of like looking at them, taking them out of context, but also I feel like we, we're we we're big on that because I think that for us, we're always like, you know, like God first, right? Like, I think that a lot of the things that we do, um, we wouldn't be able to do it if we didn't get the opportunity. And sometimes like even this conversation, I feel like, you know, God put people together to be able to do this. So we, we take a lot of this stuff in like, play with it, take it out of context, because the messages are so universal, right? You don't have to be, we don't have to talk about a certain God for you to feel like, you know, everything in due time, have patience, build it slow. Like you don't it's have to, energy. right, it's, it's, it's a certain energy. And I think even with the other one that um, it says, like, if you lose yourself until you want to, I think it's, it's something that's very like universal. Like, you know, you, you, you're gonna put in the work or you're not gonna put in the work. You're gonna care about the thing or you're not gonna care. You're gonna open your eyes and see that something is happening around you that's harming the environment or harming you or harming your family. And that's something that's very universal, I think. And these pamphlets are like that. It's something that they're, and they're like, it's like a, there's like the shock thing to it where you'll get this pamphlet and it'll say something like, you know, like, 
Like uh, those who believe, those who believe are gonna have an abundant life. And you see it on the floor, you'll pick it up. You'll be like, wait, what is this about? You know, I want an abundant life. And you pick this up and it's like this very crazy graphic um, printed in some of the shops here. So like the printing is done very like, it feels old, like everything about it, I think is something that is very interesting. We, we collect these, so we have like a folder and we just like been collecting these like things. And I know other people who do it as well, because we have friends who told me they have a bunch and they've shown us. So other people do it as well, because they find them interesting. Like I said, I think it's just something we do, but so many other people also like doing it. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the hat that you made. Was that different um, graphics that you sort of compiled together to create? Which one? The hat with the red, lettering on the top oh, yeah. That's, yeah that's essentially that yeah that it's, one that one was just us we created a different yeah. um like different tech like yeah. font, and then we ended up doing that but that had nothing to do with the pamphlets that was just kind of like the graphics that we kind of like see everywhere yeah but it's the same it's kind of like we're, it's that's not necessarily the pamphlets but it has a lot to do with like just the graphic work that we see here on an everyday basis. Right? Yeah, I mean, or like signage that you probably like see. Yeah, cars, yeah, like signage, like uh, decals on cars, things like that. It's very much like sporty racing feel. Like there's this movement to that font. So then we created that. And it was kind of, yeah. it's a play on, it's a play on, you know, like we say consume less, but there's so many informal vendors that create an economy from us consuming more. So it's, uh, it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Has it has yeah, it been a little bit harder to pull? Oh, no, has it been a little bit harder to pull resources since you guys have been in lockdown and you don't have much time to be out as much? Yeah, we we I think a lot of the stuff a lot of the stuff that we're doing now, um, it's like it's post consumer, right? So it's a lot of stuff from the stuff from the markets, and we're just using we're sourcing a lot a lot from the markets. Like with it, excuse me, we're there all the time, um, sourcing specific fabrics, and then. Kind of like taking them apart and using them as basis for other things um but we'll buy garments and take them completely apart and like use every piece of it even down to the zippers and we can in the buttons or whatever we'll take them off and use them on other pieces um but a lot of the a lot of what we're sourcing now is is, is post-consumer um and i was gonna ask them. So in, the, in the like in the tailors and in the southeast here, the local tailors, is you know, it's gotten a lot, a lot slower. It's not as abundant. Um, there's still things being made in factories and things like that, but sometimes it may be materials that are stretchy and aren't as favorable for us to work with. So that's a real thing. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, so uh, are you working on, what are your plans for your future? You know, you're expanding your team right now, which is exciting. Uh, uh, I think we want to be able to like, offer more of this to like the community. Like I think, so if we, I think like when I think about like what we're doing, I think if we could make it something that it's very approachable to like a lot of people, I think a lot of folks would just reconsider the way that they're they're looking at their, their, their clothes. So if they could go somewhere, if you can go somewhere with like old pair of, you know, denim that you have and tell the person to make you something else with it, like you would. So I think it's just being able to be able to communicate that to people. And then also like maybe think about physical locations where like it doesn't become something where like it's online and you guys, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about visuals and aesthetic and we're more talking about like an art, mm -hmm. an art point of view. But what happens when you talk about just regular folk coming in who aren't necessarily interested in having like the visual conversation, but they're, they know the practicality of like, oh, I have a pair of denim, can I make, a skirt with this? Can I make a shirt with this? Hey, can you make me something because I don't want to throw this out? And I think it's just that. Like, I think the future is really like, how how can how can what we do be like more accessible to like just people who who are really like uh, just everyone like that can that needs it rather than just like oh we have a group a, a small group of, of a niche that like understands custom work. What if we were able to communicate custom work to the community and they were able to like do that work, you know? It's like, really interesting. Go in and bring it in. Oh, can I do this? You know, I think it changes. It changes the conversation. It's interesting because even earlier on in the conversation, you're talking about like so much of um, so much of how you, the literal things that you used to make, right, are sourced from, are, are used before, right? Um, are pre, 
either you know pre or post consumer materials, but it also struck me that the way that you talk about processes is similar, right? So reusing ideas of history, reusing um, processes that are useful or processes that model well. And yeah. it struck me how much like this idea of modeling um, is, could be like an important way of thinking about your work, right? That you might in the community, instead of like as slow as talking about like the kind of nonsensical problems of um, like brands that are like, we upcycle and now we're gonna industrialize upcycling, right? that the alternative to that might be presenting a different kind of model for like structuring a local economy, right? Um, where different people, does that make sense as a kind of- No, I know. I, I, to what y'all are, yeah. Yeah, it is, because I think uh, when you say models or like processes, I think, yeah, it is important because, you know, aside from like us being able to like highlight it, document it, I think there's also something that's very practical about it, like, you know, like, can we reuse this fabric? Is this fabric like good enough to reuse? Can we can can we work with everything that's being thrown out, right? And that ends up here, right? Because I think also another part of it that I think is super important. Like, it's one thing to read about like clothes ending up in like third world countries or in countries that are developing, and it's another it's another thing to see it, right? Like, there, there's no curation when you go to the markets here, right? It's not curated. It's like, you see the bell come in, they rip it, they throw it in the air. All the clothes are flying, people are like pulling the clothes, getting, you know, it's like, it can get, it can get chaotic, right? So to see the amount of clothes that come here, right? And you start to think like, wait, this is one place. Then I read, I was listening to a talk about in Ghana, they have a huge market that also is like crazy. And I heard that like the number ones, like as far as, um, upcycling like they upcycle there at the market they have like people sewing and all this stuff so it's like you know it's happening worldwide like a lot of the clothes that we think we're donating because people need poor people need clothes like they end up in countries like Dominican Republic countries in Africa the global you know the global north the global south right a lot of the stuff are ending up here right the global south being you know the whole thing so it's like in Latin America so it's like to see it, it's one thing. Uh, to read about it is another. Like it's a lot of clothes, man. It's like uh, it's a it's a it's an overwhelming amount of clothes, and also a lot of it doesn't sell and it gets thrown out. That's just the reality of it. No what no. There's no poor people around the world that need clothes. Everybody has enough clothes. I I, I say this, and I'm kind of like walking lightly as I say, it, but I'm pretty sure clothes are not what people need, right? So when you donate your clothes, you aren't always donating it to people who who need them. Like, like, you know, it's very cheap. You can go, I can go to the market here and get something for 10 pesos or 20 pesos. Like a lot of people can afford that. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, a, it's, a, it's like the good and the bad, right? You can, you create this market, you create this economy that's able to give people this, this uh, a way to, to have fashion, to have clothes at a cheap price, to be able to clothe themselves even just like as necessity. It doesn't have to be fashion. Um, at a very cheap price, but then you do it at the cost of shipping over so much shit that doesn't sell, that ends up in the trash, and that is uh, essentially trash. Yeah, it's essentially trash. Um, we have one more question in the chat from Osvaldo uh, slash Waldo, um, who asks, I saw the flag in the antique shop of a Don in the colonial zone, such a cool man. How did, how did it come about that y'all donated the flan? And how is it to detach from your work? I'm assuming after um, after you sell it, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we definitely didn't. didn't we, did, <laughs> we didn't donate it. I'll tell you that. It's borrowed. It's not. <laughs> no, but uh, Ramon. Ramon Ramon has an antique shop here in Sona Colonial, which I feel like if you guys come visit, you guys can see it. This guy is amazing. He uh. That's he, the museum. He's he's the he's the OG, as they say. He's like. His shop is incredible. He has this small shop, not too small, but relatively a good size. And he collects everything. You can. He has toys, cameras, and people bring him stuff, antique stuff. So the stuff that's in there is like, it's like a history of the place, but also a history of like Western consumerism and like everything that's sent over. And he has all this amazing stuff. So it's so jam packed in there. So then we decided to like, we, we're very good friends with him. And we decided to like have the flag there because we didn't feel anywhere else that it could fit in the museum. And his place is like a museum of like these found objects. 
So we ended up putting the, the flag there. And then we did this video and we started to invite people to go there. So a lot of people that come to like uh, the Colonial Zone go to his shop. And it's also there. But Ramon is like one of our best friends because like he has this very interesting relationship with objects where he used to sell paper and how he started to collect objects was that he would put like the objects, the toys, whatever it was as placeholders on them, on the street as he was selling paper. And then he started to collect so many weird ones that he started to switch them on and off because he liked them so much that he started to like amass all this, all these objects that he was collecting. And it was conversation it, pieces. It was conversation pieces. People would stop and be like, oh, where'd you get that? And then from there, he started to like have so much of it that he opened a little shop and it was very small. People would pass by and be like, you could hell? barely go in. You could not go in. Everything was like super curated. It's so, it's incredible. I. I wish we could just like send them a picture, but it's like almost over. But anyway, but um, but yeah, that's how it ended up there. Ramon is a very interesting guy, and he sells basically stuff that they're, they're found objects and antiques and everything he thinks that is interesting. He has a very good eye. And sometimes people will go there and sell things that they find. Yeah, yeah. Which is creates another problem. That's amazing. Um, well, we're. I think this is a great place to stop the formal part of the conversation and say thank you so much for joining us and for talking to us about what you make and all of your interests and amazing work.